Time for an extraction flow chart how-to. When you're done with a reaction, you will inevitably have more than one species present, and the thing you want has to be isolated. Extraction is one of many ways to accomplish that, and it takes advantage of differences in solubilities. Let's use an example where we have our target organic compound present that we want. So I'll draw that in. So let's suppose we want this ester here. And, um, you know, fairly nonpolar with that benzene ring. Uh, and the, it's also got some leftover reagents and uh, byproducts. So maybe um, there's the base DMAP, dimethyl amino pyridine. Perhaps there's uh, some carboxylic acid present acetic acid. Maybe there's triethylamine. So let's suppose we have those three, those four items mixed. We want to separate them and specifically we really want to get this one out. This is our target. But so we have to isolate it from those four things. Those particular, these particular species will all have different solubilities at different pHs. So the first thing you would tell yourself if you're going to, if you know extraction's part of the plan, you should ask, so this is our target molecule, and notice that it's organic, and it's mostly nonpolar, and a, it's not really an acid or a base. Whereas acetic acid, is clearly an acid. And amines we know are basic. When you can go through a mixture and label things as acid, bases, or essentially neither, uh, less reactive toward acid or base, then we can actually take advantage of that, those differences in uh, acidity as well, basicity, uh, to af affect changes in their solubility. When we can change their solubility, an extraction is a viable means to separate these. So what we would do is take those four items, they're all in the same phase right now in the same liquid, liquid, and we would put them in the separatory funnel. So if we did that re our reaction in a solvent, uh, which wasn't mentioned there, but um, we could, a common solvent would be something like diethyl ether. And we don't even really need the structure because it's not, it is something we'll separate later, but um, diethyl ethyl ether or ET2O, or sometimes even just called ether. That is gonna be an organic solvent. And so if our reaction was done in a solvent, I'm just picking this one because it's a common one. then that is also a component there, but that's the liquid they're all dissolved in. So they're all dissolved in diethyl ether. So let's go ahead and uh, list them, everything else that's in the diethyl ether. So I'm starting at the top of the flow chart. I'm going to actually draw the structure of absolutely everything. So the flow chart's officially starting now. So we have these four species all dissolved in diethyl ether. They're all organic. They have various polarities and acidity, acidities or basicities, but we've, we're starting with them all. Oops, I kind of chopped that off. Let's do this. In ether. Okay, so then comes the separatory funnel and we are going to add something that would allow these to come out. Which one, you say? Well, how about we know that this, let's label these things again. This is an acid. This is a base. This is a base. And this is neither. I mean, yes, conceivably you could find a very strong acid to deprotonate that, um, or a strong 
excuse me, to protonated or a strong base to depronated, but compared to the others, it's not characterized as acid or base. Like an amine is a classic base, carboxylic acid is a classic acid, because uh, we don't have to have strong acids or bases to get either of those to participate in acid-base reactions, whereas an organic compound with CHs only to offer, uh, you need a stronger acid or base, um, or to protonate that, we would need a stronger acid or base than simply to protonate an amine, right? So uh, we could take advantage of that difference uh, in reactivity with towards acids bases. I am noticing this one first. We can get that one out and leave three behind if we react this first. So in other words, take the acid out of base. We're gonna add a weak base because we don't wanna go overkill and make other things react. So something like sodium hydrogen carbonate is great. And that's not, we don't just throw solid in. By the way, that's baking soda. <laughs> so we're not gonna just dump that in. We're actually gonna have a solution of it. So it's aqueous. Well, this is an ether. Ether is organic compound. These are not, this means this is the water layer and it is not soluble with the ether layer. So what happens is we have two layers. And so this would be our aqueous and this would be our ether layer with everything that's in it. So that's our organic layer and this is our water layer. In the water layer, we will have our sodium hydrogen carbonate in our ether layer, and it's on the top, by the way, because the density of ether, I'm not looking at densities of everything, only the solvent, not the solutes, the density of ether is lower than the density of water. So it's less than one, water's around one, right? So if you are to add aqueous sodium hydrogen carbonate where that is the solute within the water, and you allow them to mix, even though they do not, they're not miscible, if you um, gently swirl it, you can get the base in contact with some of the species in the organic layer. And the one that would be the first to react would be this acid, right? You would deprotonate it and you make the acetate. Acetate is an anion, hence polar, no longer soluble in the organic layer. Because the organic layer is for nonpolar things, right? So now we get two arms of our flowchart. The flowchart's very useful logic diagram to help us understand what is going on in the process in the lab. It summarizes that for us. So as I write out my flowchart, I have separated things into two layers. I'm gonna call one the aqueous layer and one arm the organic layer. I have moved this acid into the aqueous layer by making its conjugate base, acetate. So charged, therefore now H2O soluble. It leaves that organic layer and goes into the aqueous layer while the organic layer keeps the unreacted, less polar compounds that are still organic soluble like the target molecule and the two bases, DMAP and triethylamine. All right, so now remembering that this is our target and that it is different from the other two, we're always looking for that, What's not like the other? This is not like the other two because these two are bases and this is not as basic. So knowing these are more basic, if we add an acid, we should be able to get this to likewise ionize. Once it ionizes, in other words, when it gets protonated, it makes a charged species, it will be water soluble. Okay, so let's do that. Let's add an acid. So in other words, we can collect this ether layer after we have drained off the aqueous layer that we didn't want in this case, right? So we drain that off and we're not really keeping it because our goal was to isolate only the organic target molecule. So let's take this and add some HCl. So this is in ether still, all right? All three of those are dissolved in ether. We're gonna add, put that back in the separatory funnel 
And we're gonna add, so just to remind you what we're doing, those three are in the separatory funnel in the ether layer. Um, it's, it's a single layer once again, right? Looks like that when we add it. Then when you're gonna add the HCL, aqueous HCL, you go back to having two layers again. So this is my aqueous layer with HCL in there and my organic layer, which has ether, right? Uh, so what did the HCL do? It protonated the bases. So we've made ions again, which means they are gonna go into the aqueous layer. And so remember we have a ether a layer mixing with an aqueous layer and then things travel between the two layers based on their changes in solubility. By getting protonated, these bases are now more soluble in the water than they are in ether. So they migrate with enough swirling, they will migrate from the organic layer to the aqueous layer. So what do they look like? There's the D map. And, oh, I didn't finish. It can't look like that, it has to be protonated. So we protonate that and we protonate the diethylamine. I'm gonna make that note. Now, H2O soluble. So if we wanted to recover those, we can neutralize them separately, but they're now separated. We could pour off that, uh, drain out the aqueous layer, collect it. We could use a, you know, in other words, we'd put something like a, a flask under here, open the stopcock and drain out the bottom layer, collect it, and it would be over here. Close the stopcock but before the top layer drains out and we have what's left in the organic layer. What is left in the organic layer? Only our target molecule and the ether. It's still dissolved in ether. Now I'm going to note that we are not done here. If you took an IR, it wouldn't look very nice. You could see big, broad water peak. Why? This is an organic layer. Uh, water peak meaning big OH stretch for the water. Um, so if this is the organic layer, then why do we see water? Well, it's because it has actually been mixed with water. It's wet and water is slightly soluble. So you, it's still contaminated with water and um, you want to remove the water. Any traces of water, so trace, so it's, it's referred to as wet uh, or your crude product, um, trace water, still there. So we put in something that will mop up that water. And at that point, we're not using the separatory funnel anymore, but it's still considered a separation process because in the separation scheme, we are removing things and um, isolating them, right? So flowcharts can apply to more than just a, an extraction, of course. So right here would be an example of what it would look like after we collected, perhaps um, we drain out our, let's get this out of the way. We drain out our aqueous, right? And it's gone. We're left with only the organic. We drain that out into our beaker. And at the bottom of our beaker, we sprinkle a little bit of drying agent, often something like magnesium sulfate or sodium sulfate. Those are the common ones. So let's put that here. So we're going to put over the down arrow what we're changing and what we're adding. So we'll put MgSO4, it's usually anhydrous. It's a drying agent, it's a solid. And how do we separate a solid from a liquid? Not extraction, just filtration. And filter. So you're going to have, so you might just to remind you that we're doing that, it, that's not extraction anymore. We filter off the solid. So on the side that's still the liquid, we call that the filtrate. And the solid that we collect is called the residue. That would be our magnesium sulfate that bound to however many water. It absorbs so it's 
It likes water. It makes complexes with water. So it's a good drying agent. So we buy it in its anhydrous form and store it carefully to make sure no water from the air gets in there. And uh, then we sprinkle that into something that needs to have the water removed and it mops up the water. You can even kind of see it visibly change. It gets kind of um, crusty as it binds to water. And um, as, the, as that process completes, you can filter off the solid residue and the filtrate will have just your target molecule dissolved in the liquid you used for extraction. And we might say that's dry now, even though it's wet, it's a liquid, it's dried. There's no more water left. So to really isolate only this, we have to get rid of the solvent. Remember the solvent's only there for, you know, for helping us handle it and to carry out the extraction process. So ether is a great solvent because of its low boiling point. We can usually just evaporate, which is another separation process. So you're taking advantage of differences in boiling point, right? So you're, you can separate the ether. It either goes off as a gas or you can recondense it and collect it as a liquid, depending on your evaporation technique. Um, and then you isolate your ester, whether it be an oil or a solid, and it's all by itself now, ready for analysis to d take. Uh, you'll get a nice, clean IR, NMR, et cetera, with no extra peaks from these other contaminants. So this is the final goal. Sometimes you want to isolate two different organic compounds. Sometimes you want to actually go and analyze several. But if you only, um, if this was the main product, this is how you would get that arm of the flowchart worked out. Okay, I hope that was helpful. And I want you to try your own and actually it wouldn't be a bad idea to try this again, to follow these arms.